Welcome back. So we hope that you came back energized for our next session today. We understand that the lunch might be too delicious for some of us, so we're stuck at the restaurant. So we are extending the time to end the session too by 4.15 p.m. So feel free to ask questions if you have and feel free to, of course, just uh, come and you will need to queue. So just another slight change of plans. Um, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rais to come on stage for session two titled Economic Prosperity. Assalamu alaikum and uh, very good afternoon. Uh, hearty lunch, I'm sure. Uh, cold environment is good and hopefully no one falls asleep. I think uh, usually after lunch is going to be a little tough. But we have very exciting uh, discussion item today. Uh, we are talking about uh, economics prosperity. What is economics prosperity? Uh, as they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes prosperity is also in the eye of the beholder. There are some countries who talk about gross domestic happiness. Some talk about gross domestic product. And others talk about social welfare being. So there are many stories along what is economic prosperity. But I will also remind myself that I'm not the speaker. I'm a moderator today. So I will try to minimize my views, opinions, but uh, I will moderate the session. Yes, we are behind time, a lot, not a little. So we have uh, probably one hour, 15 minutes. So each speaker will be allotted about 20 minutes uh, each to speak. And uh, therefore, uh, thereafter, we will have some Q&A. Uh, I hope that you will have a productive uh, session uh, and I would like to invite the first speaker who will be talking about road map, map for economic reforms in Tunisia. Dr. Ayman and Dr. Mohamed Nouri, please. Thank you very much. Uh, many thanks for all the organizers. Uh, a special thank for uh, Atlas Network that financed this policy paper we are presenting. I co-authored it with uh, my friend and colleague Mohammed Nouri. Um, so uh, this uh, paper has a very long story. Uh, this uh, was supposed to be the subject of uh, a workshop in Tunisia but taking into account the political pressure uh, there, uh, the organizers decided to move the workshop here, and this gave us, uh, of course, the, the pleasure to, to meet in all of, of you, and that was, <laughs> I'm afraid, a bad, a bad cause, but there are some advantages, so we are happy for, for that. So many thanks for all those who contributed to make this project possible. Uh, I, uh, the, the paper was written in Arabic and it is being translated and it will be published both in Arabic and in English uh, very shortly, at least on the website of the I I I I ILN. So I am not going to uh, dive too much in its uh, technicalities uh, because there are things I consider that are easier read than heard. I would like instead to tell you a story. 
So, the date is 1793. The place is Paris. More specifically, just in front of the guillotine. A lady by the name of uh, Madame Dubarry, who was uh, the mistress of Louis XV, is being executed. And uh, she, she was talking with the hangman, who was in charge of her beautiful head, and she kept telling him, please, Mr. Executioner, Executioner, please give me five minutes more. Please give me five minutes more. And I think this little story summarizes very beautifully and very sadly the situation of the economy in Tunisia. Mr. Hankman, Mr. Executioner, or rather Mrs. Reality, five minutes more. Give us five minutes more. And this has been the case for a very, very, very long time. I think since the end of the 1990s. At least, according to the World Bank, that published in 2006 a report about Tunisia, it said it clearly. The model of development adopted by Tunisia has reached its limit. And reforms are necessary. Painful reforms are necessary. And since that time, we have been officially talking about painful reforms. But what we are doing, Mrs. Reality, please give us five minutes more. I will talk about the last chapter of this uh, parody, which is the current one. Then, if time allows, I will give you some other chapters, but I can talk a long time about the subject. So the last chapter, the current one. Tunisia is sitting on the verge of bankruptcy. It is not me who said that. It is uh, a, a Fitch rating, for example. Fitch has rated our uh, public uh, debt uh, CCC minus, with negative perspective, which means that Tunisia is currently uh, a junk state, so it is not very advisable to invest money in Tunisia. Uh, uh, okay, and uh, and uh, it is the last step before rating that are equal to default. So Tunisia is a, in a very very dangerous situation when it comes to its public debt. Uh, Countries in this situation would normally go to the IMF because it is the only lender capable of providing some injection of cash in order to avoid the worst scenario. And Tunisia has been negotiating with the IMF for at least three, three years now. And a staff level agreement was reached in October 2022. So at that time, we thought all that uh, the worst scenario is going to be avoided, at least for the, the, the foreseeable future. But this hasn't been the case. Why? Because the president, our president, said, Mrs. Reality, please give us five more minutes. The president has rejected the, um, the agreement his own government negotiated with, with the, the IMF. Why? Saying that he doesn't accept diktats from the foreign world. And Tunisia, being a sovereign country, we are going to count upon ourselves without, of course, specifying which resources he uh, uh, inten intends to mobilize in order to apply or to, to fulfill that wish. Why Tunisia has reached this situation? Because the current power is counting on geopoliticizing Tunisian economic situation. Very clearly, it is maybe vicious, uh, but this is the bet, I think. Uh, 
Tunisian current government thinks that Europeans will not allow Tunisia to default because of the, the of your European fear about immigration. And indeed, this bet, this very dangerous bet from the government, uh, was about to be fulfilled successfully uh, in June, in May or June, uh, when the European Union offered uh, a bailout uh, solution, alternative, su supposedly to, to be al an alternative to the IMF bailout program. And what did Tunisia do? Give me more five, give me five minutes more. Because, of course, this bailout solution or bailout program, European one, was conditioned by, uh, first of all, a strong engagement from the Tunisian government against illegal immigration. And, of, and very, very surprisingly, it was also conditioned by, on, uh, it was also conditioned by the, uh, the Tunisia reaching an agreement with the IMF. So, again, Tunisia is saying the famous, the famous word, give me five minutes more. This is the current situation. But why Tunisia has reached this dangerous cliff? Because I think we have a structural problem, a deep structural problem. Tunisia is a net importer. It has always been a net importer because it imports energy, it imports food, and it imports machines. Tunisia has been compensating for, its, uh, for the uh, negative uh, trade balance it has been running. It has been compensating for that through its uh, services, especially its, tourist, its, its tourism, but also through its uh, uh, relatively rigorous management of its public finance before 2011. The problem that these two conditions dependent on one factor, the stability of a rather dictatorial authoritarian regime. In 2011, this regime fell, as you know very well, you know the political story, I think. It is very famous. The economic story is less famous because it is much more infamous. Indeed, Tunisia found itself um, torn between difficult choices. The of course, tourism was par partially lost because of instability, so that there were less resources. And this is very important, social stability was lost. And social peace could only be bought through government expenditure, through public exp expenditure, through government intervention. So the government became, the state became, the employer of last resort. So it accepted many, many, many workers it did not need. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, ex it, ex it extended its expenditure to support uh, state-owned enterprises to save them, to bail out them. Uh, it uh, increased its subsidies, especially in terms of energy, etc. So this situation meant that resources were decreasing and, uh, uh, and uh, expenditure was highly uh, increasing. How did Tunisia manage to pay for that? Very simple, to borrow. And this, the result of that, that Tunisia could uh, 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 reach an unprecedented level of its national debt. It is currently around 85%, something like that, more or less 85% of our GDP. External, yeah, 
and it is ma mainly external, it is, it is an external debt, which means that we have to pay for it in hard currency. How did Tunisia succeed in uh, convincing lenders to give, to give uh, these finances through its democratic reputation? The problem that this democratic reputation has been lost since 20, the 25th of July 2001, uh, and uh, 2021, sorry. Now, in addition to this structural problem, we have a very deep, I would call it cultural problem, a mindset. This mindset is related to our anti-liberalism. Tunisia is one of the most anti-liberal countries I, 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 can, I can imagine, in terms of its culture. Its elites, most of them, consider that the word liberalism itself is an insult. I have many, many colleagues who, who tell me, uh, Ayman, you have to defend yourself. People speak of you and they say that you are a liberal. So I have to defend myself against that. And this meant that when the revolution came, political liberalism that came with it in the form of democrat democracy and democratic means was mixed with uh, an anti-liberal culture that meant that the economy was a kind of taboo. Because there was a, a kind of, uh, I, I don't know how to call it because it is very strange. Everyone agreed, there was a consensus, that Tunisia needed to change its uh, model of development. But having said that, no one would tell you exactly in which direction we should go. Why? Because everyone knew that realistically, the only possible direction we should go is a kind of, mar a kind of social liberalism with a market-driven economy, uh, and uh, to encourage enterprises, etc. But no one wanted to do that. Certainly trade unions did not want to do that because of their interests and because of the dominant discourse that prevented such a direction. Uh, intellectuals were absolutely against this, this way because uh, they, uh, by adopting anti-liberal discourse, it was easy for them to adopt radical positions while uh, uh, not doing anything. S and politicians were fearful of any steps that went against public opinion. How much time have I got? Five minutes. Five minutes left. Okay, so this meant that revolution in Tunisia was interpreted in a mixed, in a mixed, under a mixed light. Uh, we were for democracy, but we were against liberalism. And this is, I think, a very problematic situation because, frankly, I don't know anything else but liberal democracy. The term illiberal democracy, I don't really know what it does mean. Um, and revolutions have two spirits. The first one is anti-privileges. Anti the first one is, the second one is pro-privileges. The first one says we have to be equal, so we have to fight against privileges. The second one says, we are equal, so we have to share privileges. And I don't think that I am overstating the situation 
when I say that Tunisian problem was that the second spirit over dominated Tunisian experience. We were all trying to find some ways to share privileges rather than to be fighting against privileges. This situation can be summarized in my first statement. Mrs. Reality, please give us five more minutes. We did not want in Tunisia to pay the price of a change. We did want to have democracy. I think that most people wanted democracy. But we understood democracy in a very totalitarian way. We thought that democracy meant an overarching state that would uh, go everywhere uh, to uh, promote its presence and to provide people with services. And when some voices said that what we are, what we should do is uh, to move from this mindset, to move from a state that wants to do everything in order to have a state that gives more opportunities. When these voices were, uh, were trying to make an argument, they were simply accused of being liberal, and that was enough to discredit them in the eyes of the public. So our paper tried to find a kind of compromise between what the people want, what the people need, but what reality dictates in order to overcome this trap of Please, Mrs. Reality, give us five minutes more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, uh, for not asking five minutes more for the conversation. Uh, I never asked for five minutes. Uh, so it was an interesting uh, presentation and discussion of what's uh, going on in Tunisia. Uh, I think some of the experiences are shared across. Uh, we have uh, many uh, government indulging in business and some says the business of government is not in business. So uh, these are the important issues. We have issues like food security, brain drain, much more. And how are we going to handle this vis-a-vis -vis, uh, economic prosperity? So next uh, will be Dr. Mustafa of Turkey. He will be talking about free markets perspectives from Turkey. Please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear my colleagues, dear friends, I would like to start with extending my appreciation and gratitude to organizers of this meeting, Dr. Ali Salman, uh, Tasneem, and all others, for making this event possible. This is my second visit to Malaysia. Uh, I have friends living here. Uh, after so many years coming back from United States after finishing PhD studies, I met my dear friend, Dr. Remli Mustafa from Malaysia last night, who picked me up from the airport. So it was nice to be with you again in this country. Today, I am going to talk about free markets, uh, the journey of Turkey towards free market in recent decades. Turkey is one of the critical countries, as Graham Fuller said in one of the, uh, his books, the pivotal country in the Muslim world for several reasons. Turkey is a country somehow 
has some experience with pluralist democracy, parliamentary system, and free market economy. Yet, uh, this situation, the process is not a smooth and easy one. There has been ups and downs, fluctuations, volatility, U-turns, etc., etc. So I am going to just briefly mention the five pillars of a market economy, importance of Turkey for the Muslim world, and Turkey's free market experience toward free market since early 1980s. Uh, and I am going to focus especially in the last two decades. That means JDP, Justice and Development Party, or Erdogan period, okay? Economic performance in the 1920s. 19, sorry. Okay. There are, my dear colleagues, friends, two main perspectives regarding as to the fundamental questions, economic questions on who is going to decide on what to produce, how much, how to produce, for whom to produce, how do we organize economic activities, who is going to decide, the state, government, or some state planning organization, or Politburo, or a central agency on behalf of the public, or are we, individuals, entrepreneurs, consumers, and producers, will decide on what to produce, how to produce, for whom to produce? So, <clears throat> uh, if, if individuals, entrepreneurs, consumers, or producers will decide on answering these fundamental questions, we are talking about a free market economy. If, on the other hand, state planning organization or government or central planning is deciding, then we are talking about a command system as opposed to free market system. So there are basically five main institutions of a free market economy. Private property, freedom of choice and entrepreneurship, competition that is free entry and exit to the markets, Free trade with internal or outside world, doesn't matter. Limited government. In the end, we can talk about supremacy of the consumers in a free market economy because the demand created by consumers will decide on what to produce, how much, for whom to produce, and how to produce, okay? So, uh, I am not going to go into the details of this you know, Islam versus free market economy because I think it will be main theme of uh, tomorrow's sessions. So they will talk about in detail. But in my opinion, my dear friends, there is no incompatibility or hostility between Islam and free market economy. They are perfectly compatible and you can find many uh, verses from Quran and from you know, uh, hadith supporting the basic tenets, main institutions of a free market economy. Okay? Now let's talk about Turkey's journey toward free market economy in recent decades. Founded in 1923, after the collapse of Ottoman Empire, which collapsed after, it, at the end of First World War, Turkey has been founded in 1923, okay? Turkey is a pivotal country in the Muslim world because it has a very strategic geographical location, just intersection of Asia, Africa, and Europe at the intersection of three ancient continents with 85, more than 85 million people, with uh, uh, about 90, hundred billion dollars of GDP with GDP per capita of around ten thousand dollars okay and also Turkey has very special 
historical, political, social, cultural, and religious relations with ancient, you know, uh, Central Asian republics, with the Arabian Peninsula, Middle East, North Africa, and the Balkans. So it's a very strategic country. So the experience of Turkey toward free market economy would be somehow a role model for the rest of the Muslim world. Okay, in the recent history, that means in the last 100 years, Turkey was at the beginning, in the first half of 20th century, it was basically a statist, centralist, command economy. There was just one single political party and it dictated everything. What to do, how to do, for whom to do, you know, what to produce, how much to produce, etc. Et Almost everything was controlled by government. In the second half, we started somehow experiencing with pluralist democracy and free market economy. Under Mendes, between 1950 and 60, we tried at least a pluralist democracy and some initiatives toward opening up the country, all right? But it was actually interrupted with, as Dr. Uh, Bijan Shahin in the early session said, military interventions, coup d'etat, uh, de they say, uh, the military intervened in 1960. That was the first military interventions. Uh, we had several of them after that. Almost every decade, we had one in 1960, 1971, 1980, 1997, 2007, and the last one is the coup d'etat uh, we had in 2016, as recent as 2016. So democracy and free market economy process was not a smooth and easy process in Turkey. We had, between 60 and 80, a central planning period. So, inspired by the Soviet type of central planning, the uh, military interventionists actually established state planning organization in 1961. Since then, Turkey has been ruled under five-year development plans. The 12th one is still underway. And uh, Ozal period, Mr. Ozal, late Mr. Ozal was a critical period, a turning point, if you like. He was a very pro-free market man. He really accepted, internalized the idea of free market, the value of free market, openness, freedom, etc., etc. So he was the one, actually, who really initiated the free market process. Uh, in 1970, sorry, 1993 and 2002, I would call it a lost decade because it was back to the command economy from where Özal, you know, left. And we can divide Erdogan period into two within itself. Justice and Development Party has been ruling the country for the last 21 years, that is, last two decades. Within that, we can talk about two separate, you know, periods. Number one, first period is pro-free market, and the second period from uh, 2014 and 2022, it's a statist, protectionist, anti-free market type of policies, inward-looking policies, nationalism combined with some anti-free market policies. Uh, Sorry. Now, let's look at the economic performance in the last two decades. That is under Erdogan or Justice and Development Party leadership, okay? Economic growth, one of the most important indicators, economic indicators, how your economy is doing. Going up or down? Are you getting rich or poorer? Now, as you can see, fluctuating economic growth has been fluctuating in the last two decades. Uh, this one is the year where Turkish economy hit the greatest economic crisis in the recent history. 
And uh, this one is the uh, global economic crisis or the mortgage crisis, if you like, uh, in 2008 and 9. And you can see the actually declining trend in the second decade, starting from 2011 up until 2021, you can see the decelerating rate of economic growth, okay? Now, another economic indicator is GDP per capita. Uh, in order to measure, are you getting richer or not? Is your welfare is improving or not? This is one of the key economic indicators, GDP per capita, right? And you can see from 2001 up until 2013, you can see there is a clear upward trend. The GDP per capita accelerated, increased sharply, almost sharply, because starting from $2,000 up until $12,000. $500, $600 in 2013. But after that, that is in the second period of ruling of JDP, G, uh, JDP, is you can see it's falling down from $1,200 up until like, you know, uh, eight and a half, nine thousand dollars $9,000. Okay, another one, inflation. Inflation, how you know your life is going more expensive or cheaper? What are the prices? Are they going up or not? So the inflation is look from in the early, very early of the Erdogan period, they actually controlled inflation after so many years, 35 years of chronic high inflation, Erdogan and his government, his government was able to control it, reduce it to the single digit levels from 70% to single digit levels, like 8% or so. From six, uh, 2004 up until 2017 or 16, they were able to control it at the single digit levels. But, as you can see, in the second half of the ruling, that is in the last decade, inflation is getting out of control from single digit levels up until almost 70% again. So we went back to where we started some 20 years ago. Sad but true. All right, uh, can you? Unemployment is another critical indicator. And it has been around 10%. And you can see the slightly upper trend from 2012 and onwards, that is in the second half of GDP ruling period, unemployment was not falling. All right. Uh, what about budget deficit? As you can see, one of the key reasons why Erdogan government was successful in getting economic indicators going up in the first decade, to me, was financial discipline they achieved, or fiscal discipline, independent central bank, etc. And you can see, this is the budget deficit, okay, under control, Financial and fiscal discipline has been achieved in the first decade. Starting from 2013, you can see a clear upward trend. Increasing budget deficits will force you to finance them either by printing or increasing taxes or getting borrowing from internal sources or outside sources. And if you actually use printing money, all right, then you will face high inflation unavoidably, as you all economics guys will should know about. Okay, what about current account deficit? Turkish current account deficit, 
uh, in the first decade from 2001 up until 2013, even though there has been you know, fluctuations, it has been an important problem. When economy is growing fast, you have to import a lot of oil, natural gas, and some other uh, uh, capital goods, as they say, investment goods, as economists say, right? So there has been a serious level of current account deficit up until $70 billion or something, but in the second uh, half, in the second period, in the second decade, when the economic growth decelerated, getting, you know, falling down, then there is no need to import much. That's why you can see decelerating current account deficit. In other words, current account has been, current account deficit has been a problem with Turkish economy. Uh, as long as the energy gap and the capital goods gap is there, then you have to somehow give certain degree of current account deficit, right? What about interest rates? Erdogan's government was very sensitive against high interest rate for understandable reasons. You know, there are just, there are, they are religiously motivated. They said, we want to get rid of this interest business. But in my opinion, it is very questionable. We should question it whether riba that is banned by Quran is the same thing as the interest rates as zillions, you know, several different types of interest rates that we are talking about today is very important question. But regardless of that, if you look at how were the interest rates doing during Erdogan period, the political force on the central bank, monetary authorities, they openly said you have to reduce interest rates. But if you cannot achieve, do not achieve predictability, improving the environment atmosphere for investments, if you do not reduce the risk of country, then by forcing with political decisions, by forcing the interest rate to go down, does not help a lot. As I mentioned, many economic indicators has been not improving, but on the other side, they are decelerating or getting worse and worse. Look, up until 2011, 2013, there has been interest rates falling down. In the aftermath, on the other hand, it went up, and then political pressure went it down again. But after the last election, Erdogan government had to reinitiate the policies, you know, fiscal policy, um, giving importance to fiscal discipline, financial discipline, independent uh, central bank, etc. They are now trying to implement those policies which made their government to be successful, right? So they reappointed the finance minister. They kicked off some 10 years ago. Right now, they are trying to do some, you know, correction on economic policies. Uh, what about exchange rates? Exchange rates, you know, is uh, a critical uh, indicator showing the purchasing power of a national currency against other currencies, right? As you can see, TL, Turkish Lira, against dollar has been very successful. Sorry, go back. Can you go back? Yeah. Ah, okay. Was even less than two. One dollar was less than two Turkish lira for a long time, starting from 2001 up until 2013. And after that, uh, for you know, several internal and external factors that I would mention if you like. Dr. Then, uh, Dr. Mustafa. Yes. Your time is... Five minutes. Uh, no. It's up. Actually, Done? Nicole has been trying to <laughs> ask you to stop. But anyway, please give me five minutes. 
Anyway, uh, can I just finish up? Yeah, please. Okay. okay. Uh, go ahead. Change it. Okay. FDI inflows are falling down. Go ahead, please. And you can see clearly that when economic policies are pro-freedom, free market economy, the economic performance is quite high. When it is anti-freedom, anti-free market, inward-looking policies, then the economic performance goes down very clearly. Same thing, okay, please. Same thing here. So, just in one sentence, for a country, in order to improve welfare, improve economic indicators, free market, outward looking policies, reforms, political as well as economic reforms, certainty and bringing the country risk down is very critical. If you are following pro-free market policies, the economic indicators goes up and vice versa. Thank you for listening patiently. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Turkia with uh, many data points and in the interpretation of those uh, respective data points. Uh, I think uh, there are two elements uh, to it. Uh, we also have to consider, we are talking about economic prosperity. Whatever doesn't bring economic prosperity, it brings uh, impoverishment of the nation and the society. Uh, like, for instance, corruption. Uh, corruption is a big problem everywhere. Uh, we in Malaysia recorded uh, the largest uh, kleptocracy case in the world. And uh, recently uh, we released a study that we have lost 4.5 trillion ringgit over the last 26 years uh, through corruption and leakages. These are worrying things. So corruption is, is a big issue, yeah? The second, uh, I hope somebody will touch on this, is the geopolitics and geoeconomics, the changing geopolitics and geoeconomics. Uh, we used to have a very unipolar economy world uh, with the US and EU uh, leading the charge. Now we have something called BRICS. South Africa just uh, in, in, concluded those meetings. Uh, there were original five and six just joined them. 17 waiting uh, to be also uh, joining them. So given this geoeconomics, geopolitics, uh, issues that impoverishes the nation, I think uh, it is also important to touch uh, on these issues, yeah? So I hope uh, with that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mustafa uh, to talk on Algeria and Muslim world from economic perspective, 2011 to 2019. Interestingly, I had a conversation with him over a coffee just now. So without further ado, please, and it's 20 minutes, yeah? Thank you very much, thank you very much. Nicole is, uh, will be waving a flag to you. But um, I have a lot of feeling. I'm coming here uh, in front of you, but uh, I hope to speak, because my, in Algeria we speak French, not English. And this will be, it will be for me easy to speak that in French. That, uh, je pense que je dois remercier tout le monde ici présent pour votre participation, les organisateurs. Et je trouve que votre pays est vraiment splendide. No, because, well, we are, hein? OK, yeah. Donc, uh, c'est vraiment un pays beau, des gens gentils, les femmes belles, Et la verdure, vraiment, c'est un pays euh, splendide. Et, et je pense que les Malaisiens sont heureux pour ça. OK That's uh, to explain my feeling uh, directly. Uh, I, I, will, I will talk to you about Algeria and Muslim world. Maybe, maybe we will, we will uh, talk more about, uh, more about Muslim world. But maybe I will talk more about Malaysia and Singapore. And, and last, we will look what happened in Algeria. And the perspective is from, because the organizer, Mr. Ali, I will thank him, uh, that's invite me. Then he, he asked me to think about Arab Spring, but it's from economic freedom, I. Then we have looked to freedom, freedom, and 
from Muslim world. And data are recently. Huh? Let's move, uh, why, yes. Let's move from some, some questions, like some puzzles. Because uh, we have, we have some, some questions to ask. Because, for example, why we, we, we have a lot of uh, countries in Muslim world, they have lost oil and gas, like some in, uh, in Arab uh, Muslim countries, but they, have, they are bad in f economic freedom. Hmm? Like Algeria, my country, and Iran also. For example, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, they are not free, even after having this Arab Spring. Why? Uh, but Muslim Asian countries are doing very well, comparatively to the Arab world, but they don't have any, any Asian spring. There is something uh, not at all. Why, why Asian Muslim countries are better ranked in economic freedom than Arab countries? And especially better than the Republic, Republican. We have monarchy are better than the Republic. And I think this country is doing good because he have king, I think. Uh, let's talk about what is what means economic freedom. Please, uh, the organizer, help me help me to to find the, the times. Please tell us because I have to organize myself. Hmm? Please, let me each five minutes you will uh, tell me about. Yeah? Then what me uh, what we, we we mean by by economic freedom. The main the main idea is about personal choice. Voluntary exchange, open market, defined and clearly enforced property right. This is the main issue. Individuals are economically free when they are permitted to choose for themselves and engage in voluntary transaction as long as they do not harm the, pro the person of property of others. This is the main issue, the main idea. Okay? And it's quoted. What is the pillars of economic freedom? And I, I, I am based here on the Fraser Institute. You, you, you can easy check in Google, Fraser Institute, you have, we will find a lot of data, a lot of ideas, okay? And I have used mainly the Fraser Institute report for this paper, okay? That means four things. The size of, gov of government should be small. The rule of law should be respected. The, so, the money should be sound. The trade should be free. And the market should be free. Kids market, labor market, and business market, okay? And we will, we will see uh, what, what means by Muslim says government. The, the, the idea here is that when more the government take taxes, spend money in consumption, and investment, and have our national of assets, less people will be free to use their money, talents, and times to make opportunities for them, for them and for their families, and for other peoples. Countries with lower level of, of government spending, lower marginal taxes rate, and less government investment, and state our ownership of assets earn the highest rating in the composing component of economic freedom. That means this explains the idea of if a country is free, that means the government is doing less, less in economics. Less company owned by the, by the government, less taxes, and less involving, less involving of uh, states in the economy. Another idea, well, another idea it is about legal system and property. Here, is, here the main idea is about the rule of law. Protection of the person and the rightly accused property is a central element of academic freedom. Many would argue that is the most important function of the government. The government, the main issue, it is to protect rights of people, the property of people, okay? Uh, the legal system had to, to be secure, give security to the property right. Huh? Judiciary should be independent. 
a court should be impartial and the police should be do good work. Then, in this uh, ranking, I will give you the, the results. Countries with economic and commercial law, securing property, and with independent judiciary and reliable police will have high rating. Okay? It's like, it's like explaining what the words. The sound money, that means low rate of inflation. Okay? The bad money is when, when, when the government prints money. It's not sound. And freedom, uh, uh, when, when we, the government uh, protects uh, the economy, that means don't lie, that the, the central bank don't permit to the government to print money. Okay? That's the idea. Uh, another aspect, it is trade. Uh, a country he, he will have good uh, economic freedom, that means he is open for trade. Low taxes, low tariff, etc. Okay? It's, a, it's easy idea, I think. Uh, le, le, uh, free of markets, the market of credit, labor, and business. Regulation that restricts entry into the market and interface with the, the freedom to engage with the exchange, reduce economic freedom. Countries with regulation, regulatory restraint that limit the freedom of exchange in credit, labor, and doing business will have low rating and ranking. Okay? I think it's easy. I will sample. I have choose from Singapore because uh, in this uh, conference we said Muslim countries and beyond. The beyond, I have chose Singapore. Singapore because it is championed in the world about with Hong Kong about in uh, economic freedom. Okay, Singapore is the best example. It's the champion, and we'll ca we will compare Muslim countries with this champion. Albania was was chosen because it is the most free Muslim country. Okay. Malaysia and Indonesia, because they are the largest Muslim countries. Okay, it's very important. Algeria and Tunisia and Muslim Sunni countries, because we have the, we have, they have experienced Arab Spring, and we will look at what happened after Arab Spring. Iran, a Shia country, with a lot of oil and regional impact. Bahrain, Sunni country with, without oil. Turkey, a Muslim country without oil, but with global impact. But we will see in the ranking, Turkey is not doing very well, even with a lot of impact, okay? Uh, look at that. Here it's very important. Look at Muslim country compared to other countries. We have a, in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, report, like uh, all countries we have, most free countries, 42 countries. Partly it's 80, 80 uh, country last three 40 country. Look at how many Muslim country in this category 26 24 two country most free Look at the percent of Muslim country in this in this last three self so 65 percent of Muslim countries are not free We have only five percent of Muslim country as ranked as free 30 percent Partly free, okay? Then that means we have to explain explanation. But before we look at, we look in details. Huh? We have some questions, for example. Why we have 65% countries with Muslim majority countries like us not free? Why just 5% Muslim? Uh, which element in this uh, component of our economic freedoms? Which factor explains this difference between Muslim countries? Ah, look at that. Look at what is the countries. Uh, 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 look at, we have found Singapore, the second country in the world, ranked second, uh, second two. Albania, 26. Malaysia is 40, 40, uh, 49, okay? With Brunei, Indonesia, Turkey, 112. Look at Tunisia, Algeria, Iran, Sudan. Look at that. Then we will, we will, this is in the overall, the overall. But in details, we will have, we will have some surprise, okay? 
Uh, yes. We found that Asia is better than Africa. Hmm? Malaysia, for example, Indonesia, Brunei, and Bahrain are the best in the list, and they are Asian Muslim countries, not Arab, not African. Algeria, Tunisia, Sudan, and the African Muslim countries, they have a lot to do in the list of Asian countries. Turkey and Iran are countries with regional and global impact, but they are not in the list of these countries. Let's, let's have some details. For example, here, Indonesia, yes, we have Albania better than Singapore in this uh, size of the government. Indonesia is, here is better than Malaysia, and we will, we will see the, the explanation, okay? And the, nah, now here, Indonesia has good, it's champion in the size of government. That means, uh, that means uh, uh, it's better than Singapore, uh, they have low government of conception, uh, low investment, government, low transfer and subsidize, and low number of state of, of, of assets, okay? Yes. Five minutes? No. Yes. Sure. Uh, let's move for the property of rights. Here found Malaysia is doing well. And good luck. Malaysia ranked 55, the best Muslim country in the association of property rights. Then in this uh, component, Malaysia is the best Muslim country for property rights and the rule of law. Because they have independent justice, impartial guards, very good protection of property rights, and very low military interference in the rule of law and, and politics, and low regulation restriction on sale of free property and liberal police. Malaysia is the best here in this. Uh, for sound money, we have Albany. The best, Albania is the best country also in control of inflation, okay? Uh, uh, for, tra for, for, uh, from freedom of trade, we found Malaysia, uh, we, 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 will, we will see Bahrain is the, the best uh, country in, uh, uh, in uh, tra free trade, okay? Because they have uh, low tariff, uh, low trade the taxes, uh, low tariff tra rate, and no black market exchange, and, okay? Uh, ah, markets. In, ah, here also Malaysia is the best Muslim country in the free markets of credit, labor, and business, okay? Malaysia ranked five with Brunei. Brunei is doing very well, huh? Brunei. Better than here, here, Malaysia is better than even Singapore. Uh, to access, access to uh, credit market, labor market, doing business. Both they are very close to Singapore. Ah, Singapore is second. Second, internationally, uh, internationally but Malaysia is the five country in this area. Let's, f uh, uh, here is also some details. Free credit market, Malaysia, and Malaysia better than Singapore in this uh, area. Malaysia and Brunei has the free credit market in the Muslim world. Better than even Singapore, okay? Uh, labor, free market labor, we have Brunei and Malaysia are the best Muslim country in f uh, free uh, labor market. Uh, doing business, also Malaysia is better than Singapore doing business, okay? Ah, what is explanation? I think that Singapore, uh, to explain this, uh, this results, I think Singapore have an effect on Malaysia and Indonesia and Brunei because they are closed. Um, uh, Asian countries are very close to uh, to Singapore. They have like like uh, the impact. Huh? Uh, yeah, this is my hypothesis. It is I, I, I call it the Singapore effect. Uh, Albania is a is, is good country in, in economic freedom because it is part of Europe. It's like geography. Uh, Bahrain is the uh, Bahrain, what is, what is the best country in this, uh, in this uh, index? Because the absence of oil. They have, to, they have to be free. They have to, to be free to, to have revenue. Uh, ah, the negative, the Arab Spring have a negative effect on this way. There is, with, with Arab Spring, we didn't have any change in the freedom 
اوف ايكونومكس او اوف ايكونومكس فريدوم الجيري افتر 2000 حراك از وي هاف مور ريبيليشن وي دونت ناو وي دونت ناو وي هاف سوم ريفورم ويز نيو بريزيدنت بات وي ار نوت شور وي ار نوت شور اوكي ماي كونكلوجن از ذات اجيل مجرم كانتريز ار ويل دوينغ ان ايكونوميك فريدوم Arab African countries have to learn about Asian, Asian cases. The Arab Spring no impact on economic freedom, rule of law, and protecting property of rights to own and to do business and to work and to trade with others with no barriers is the best route to prosperity. Economic freedom bring prosperity and together are solid ground for sustainable democracy. No peace. No, pros no prosperity, no prosperity, no democracy without economic, economic freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, I just received a text message from the command center. Uh, even here, the centrally command plan center, yeah? Uh, to end the session at 4.20, so you have uh, relatively short period of time, about 20 minutes, to ask question. Uh, I would suggest that the, whoever asking the questions to be concise uh, and ask the question direct, if possible. Uh, good to introduce yourself as well. So can I have the first? Okay, go ahead. Uh, huh? Can you hear? Here, there's only... Oh. Is, Okay, question, uh, question answers. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rais, Moderator. I'll be precise. Uh, my first question is to Dr. Ayman al Um My question is that, you know, like, uh, when I listen to your talk, I tend to be a little bit, um, how do I say, uh, confused by the way that you presented it. To me, that uh, the issue of political um, liberty or liberal politics is different from economics, uh, liberal economy. All right. So the way that you presented your talk just now was that you're trying to say that, you know, uh, uh, political, uh, liberal uh, politics, they're the same as, as liberal uh, economy. And I, I, I think that, you know, you have to differentiate between the two. A person can be liberal in his political perspective, but can be totally against the liberal economy itself. It is, it is not the same. And this comes to the second question to you, uh, Dr. Mustafa, uh, with regard to your, yeah, no, not you, the, the Turkish Mustafa, yeah, the Turkish Mustafa. You know, like, I saw a lot of slides, right, everything about the GDPs and stuff. But the thing that you're missing would be the Gini coefficient. You know, the, 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 the issue with the liberal economy is that in liberal economy, people have uh, argued that the system, when you talk about GDP, you might be true, right? It increases the GDP. What, but what about the Gini coefficient? The, difference, the, um, the differences in the, what you call the poor and the rich, right? What is the Gini coefficient? Because the arguments against your liberal economy and in any liberal economy in the world is that you are creating a greater uh, differences in Gini coefficient, in that the rich will get, be getting richer and the poor will be getting poorer. That's the problem with your liberal economy. And I do not think that, you know, like I myself, from the Economic Renaissance Front, from the Islamic Renaissance Front, I don't think that we agree with the idea of economic liberalism. I know that over here that we are free, we are being surrounded by uh, free marketeers over here, but Despite the overwhelming free marketers, 
I stand to my uh, what, what to say I have the uh, what you call stand that you know in Islam even though you know one person argued that uh, according to Al Quran it is not against the uh, free uh, liberal economy but I have to say that in Islam it is slightly skewed to the left I think I mentioned to you right um, my brother Mustafa from Aldira just now it is slightly skewed to the left so instead of liberal economy, it is an economy that is for the poor, that defends the rights of the poor and the downtrodden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Now, first Dr. Ayman to respond to the question, then followed by Dr. Mustafa Turkiya. No, let's, let's answer while others are scared. Please, Dr. Ayman. Give the microphone. Um, I think I will answer very simply that I disagree. I disagree that uh, political liberalism can be separated from economic liberalism, and to be more precise, and even to say it more strongly, I think that some political, uh, some liberal, uh, uh, some liberal economy is possible without liber political liberalism. In other words, uh, free markets can, uh, at least the sh in short run, prosper under a dictatorship. But I don't think that. Uh, 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 a liberal uh, political liber uh, political liberalism i mean democracy can prosper without liberal uh, without liberalism in in economic terms i think that uh, that the, and we have we have many examples we have many examples that that show that if you have political liberalism without at a minimum at least a minimum level of uh, acceptance of free market, uh, you, uh, you you go towards a kind of a to a to totalitarian democracy because the, the the public will ask for more and more, will put pressure, will put more and more pressure on the state uh, in in order for the state to assume more responsibilities, while in the same time, especially in transitional in, tra in, trans in transitional periods, the state loses. It means, in other words, when the state, and this, this is what happened in Tunisia, when the state lost its capacities, and when the state was so weak that trade unions and other intermediary bodies were stronger uh, than, than the state itself, at that precise time, if you don't have liberal economy, you, you, you know what happens? what happens at the, that the state is forced into assuming responsibilities that, they, that the state cannot, uh, cannot pay for on the long, on the long run. So it is, it is what, did, what Tunisia did. It was buying uh, social peace through, uh, through this assumption of, through this acceptance of responsibilities it did not need and uh, and responsibilities it did not it could not it could not choose thank you thank you dr ayman uh, for the respondent uh, do, now dr mustafa ajar uh, one and a half minutes I don't know. Uh, please. <laughs> because i would like to allow more questions to be asked <laughs> okay uh, good question and good comment as they say uh, two things number one Political environment, I agree with you, is important. Uh, in intellectual, philosophical, political internalization of the value of freedom and free market economy is extremely important for the sustainability of the economic policies, right? There's no doubt about that. So I think one of the most important problems with our leadership, not only in Turkey, with many Muslim countries alone, they have difficulty to internalize, to accept, to legitimize the importance and the value of freedom, individual liberties, political liberties, economic freedoms, etc., etc. Second, the issue of equity versus efficiency. One fact is more liberal democracies and more economic freedom countries have, in general, 
have a more equal distribution of income when you look at the issue globally. Even though there is no systematic causative relationship between economic freedoms and equality, income equality, we can show examples from both sides, right? So there are countries with economic freedom with higher level of equality and vice versa. So there is no uh, causative relationship. We can see examples from each side. Plus, in the first decade of uh, Turkey, the, where the Erdogan government and the JDP parties economic performance is going up, Gini coefficient, which measures the degree of inequality, income inequality, were actually falling down. In the second decade, it is going up again. Uh, and lastly, are you uh, demanding, do you want equality in poverty or inequality in prosperity? That is a very important question. I would personally prefer inequality in prosperity, where everybody is doing fine, more or less. Because communist regimes, socialist economies were much equal in terms of income distribution than the liberal democracies and economic freedom countries, but they were equal in poverty, not in prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Maybe. Yes. Thank you. I will. Next um, question. Thank you, Dr. Raiz Hussain. Sabi Ahmad, I am not an economist. Okay, so I'll put it out there. Uh, as a human rights activist, maybe some 10 years ago, we had a lot of issues concerning structural adjustment in Asia, South Asia, and this arose out of the free market. So my only stint of trying to understand is Joseph Stiglitz, formerly of World Bank, and he turned his back on World Bank to critique the free market economy. So I, I'm, I'm making a comment. I'm sure you have your answers. But we are not dealing at arm's length in a free market economy. And how many of our countries in the South have paid dearly for this? Thank you. OK. But you don't, that's a rhetoric question. One speaker to respond. Any one of you? From the question? Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. My question is the following for all of you, especially to Dr. Ayman. Uh, uh, do you mean by what you said that democracy thrives only in capitalism, in capitalistic system? If we don't have capitalism, democracy doesn't work. And the problem of these elites in the Arab Spring, they failed to find a new model because they, have, they didn't have enough courage to say what we need is a capitalistic. You remember all of you, Weber. Weber said capitalism is the only rational uh, um, system. So that's why it succeeded. We have a, a bureaucracy and personal bureaucracy and legal bureaucracy because we have capitalism. So shall we really have this, uh, this uh, uh, mutual relationship? I mean, uh, um, we have the design, the market design, the way, for example, the European, the uh, East Europe, the post-Soviet, for example, uh, uh, transitions, they, they, they were working to find this, um, this uh, balance, if you want. Many of them have failed, and many have succeeded, of course. So for us in the Arab Spring, shall we really put in front of us this balance? You mean that we didn't, we didn't find this model, the economic model or the developmental model, simply because we refuse to say that capital, capitalism is the answer? Dr. Ayman, to respond? Microphone. Yeah. Uh, so I'll say a few words about the first question because I would, I don't want the lady to to to, to wait without uh, without an answer. Uh, I think that uh, what are we? We have to make some distinctions between uh, 
liberalism or classical liberalism and neoliberalism. I think that what, uh, what uh, the issue, uh, the neoliberalism is different from liberalism in the sense that it has uh, made uh, a free market, uh, uh, it, it has moved a free market from an economic, uh, an economic solution to a kind of solution for the whole society. We moved from a market economy to a market society, if you wish. And that is dangerous, and that can be criticized. It, transfer, it transformed the, uh, uh, the market into a norm for, for society, and that, of course, is to be nuanced uh, with, with, some, with some care. Um, as far as uh, the second question, which is my question, directly asked by my friend Amel, I think, yes, I think democracy derives from capitalism. I think that it, for some people this is sad, for some people this is not very sexy, not very attractive, not very romantic, but I think the reality shows us that there is a, 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 a very, very close connection between democracy and capitalism. And this is, it is, structurally, it is simple to explain, if you, if you wish. Because capitalism, and uh, more specifically, I would say liberalism, creates a differentiation of interests. You have many, many, many interests. And when you have many interests, you need to find a way to negotiate among these interests. So you, structurally, you need a, uh, public debate, and then you need democracy. I know that it is very, very uh, 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 short as, uh, as a summary, as a, as a presentation of democracy, but I think in the Arab world, uh, for historical reasons, we hate liberalism, we hate capitalism, because our culture is a culture of liberalization. Uh, what, th there is a difference between the culture of liberalism and the culture of liberalization. Liberalization means that you are, you are not free. You are uh, you are uh, you, you are uh, a slave, uh, either because you are a woman or because you are uh, underdeveloped or because uh, you are a, a colony, and so you need to be liberated. So here you put the, the uh, you put the the, uh, the the focus on collective freedom, the freedom of the city, freedom of the country. The sovereignty. Here you have the, the idea of the sovereign. We Tunisians are sovereign. No one will give us di uh, uh, di dictates. So this is very different from a situation that says we will we we, uh, uh, we 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 live in a world. We are too small and too weak to change that world. To change that that world. So we have to accept it with its uh, good and bad aspects. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mustafa Ajer. Uh, one and a half minutes, please. <laughs> it is too short, sir. <laughs> anyway, uh, number one, IMF and World Bank dictated stabilization and structural adjustment policies. Are they <laughs> forcing less developed countries to go worse and worse, or are they actually helping them to improve their situation? This is a big question. <laughs> and in the first decade in Turkey, in the last you know, 20 years, they were actually following the stabilization policy that is offered or suggested by IMF. And the economic indicators are going up very fast. And then when they, uh, okay, kick off all kinds of, you know, international pressures or something, they uh, started to implement self-ordained independent policies, etc. Then I showed how the economic indicators going terribly to the falling down. Uh, so it is, it depends. It depends on how determined you are, how consistent you are in in, uh, in following consistent policies, right policies, instead of popular, you know, uh, policies fluctuating, and uh, as they say, election economy. When you are approaching towards elections, then you forget about all the consistent policies 
freedom, the rule of law, etc., et forget it, then you start to consolidate the waters. So it is not good. Uh, regarding the other question, uh, if you can show me, dear colleague, if you can show me a country which is actually democratically bad, but economically doing very, very, you know, perfect. Or if you can, if you can, <laughs> if you can show me economic and political relations, economic and political relations most of the time go hand in hand. Economic freedoms and political relations, political freedoms, okay? If you do not have economic freedoms, you cannot resist against the oppressive policies of political authorities. And vice versa, if you do not have political institutions, then economically you are in a terrible situation. You don't have property rights protected by the government, by the rule of law. Uh, recently, I translated a book by Rainer Zittelmann, a German uh, scholar, uh, talking about anti-capitalist fallacies, right? So I urge you guys, this is published in 30, more than 30 countries at the same time. So you can find easily, uh, he showed historically and factually how democracy, political rights, and economic, actually, freedoms go hand in hand. And the uh, anti-capitalist feelings have no sound base when you compare it to numbers with facts, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see the reflection by the collapse of the central planning and the Soviet system. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Doctor. Man, they cannot stick to one and a half minutes. Anyway, uh, uh, I think all of us have, uh, uh, the time is up. Uh, we had a, quite a good discussion on uh, economic prosperity. I think we've seen a lot of data points, a lot of challenges, a lot of uh, criterions, uh, uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, aspects to each of these countries. I think we should congratulate the speakers. Uh, and uh, number one. Number two, of course, we have to keep in mind the changing dynamics, the changing geopolitics, the changing geoeconomy, the possibility of uh, multipolar from unipolar now. Uh, even uh, many talk about capitalism, many talk about uh, social market economy like the Germany does. So we need to see what is the most optimum way to attain prosperity for all. Uh, I think somebody talked about uh, elites and super elites. Uh, we do have the same situations in Malaysia. Rais, please stop now. You're not the speaker. So okay, with that, I will, I will give back to... I, I, wish, I, wish I, could, I wish I could answer a lot of questions, but uh, time is up. And I would like to uh, hand it back to the organizer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Rais, and all our esteemed speakers for the wonderful session. Kindly remind on stage. Now, I would like to invite Yang Ahmad Mulia to Kuzain Al Abidin Ibn Tuan Kumuhris, founding president and chairman Ideas Malaysia, accompanied by Mr. Ali Salman. Chief Executive Officer of Islam and Liberty Network Foundation on the stage to present the token of appreciation. Thank you. Hold on. Hey, how are you? Good to see this. How are you? Thanks. Hi. 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 Good to see you. Come. Great session. Maybe we have more time. Yeah. Let's not. Yeah. There you go. Thank you so much. We have pictures later. This morning, there we are. Oh, what was that about? Dr. Nuri. Dr. Nuri. Thank you. You don't know, know this lady has been. I'm sorry, I will support the British as well. Uh, please stay first for the photo. Yeah. Uh -huh. Photo. Yeah. Photo. One, two, 
Thank you, Thank you to Kuzin and Mr. Ali Salman. Yeah, yeah. Look for you. But that's tomorrow, no? Uh, yeah, but you, you said. Okay. okay. Today as well. Today as well. Okay. And with the same. The same? Okay. <laughs>